When did the Jewish nation stop the sacrifices of animals? Does the Bible say when the dead in Christ will be resurrected? I can't wait to hear how our guests tackle these questions and more. So stay here. I'm Crystal Lewis. I'm Rebecca Fanai. Get ready for Bible Help Desk. Welcome to Bible Health Desk. You know, Crystal, I think we take this program for granted sometimes. Um, I am growing so much in it. And, but I also think that even though we're getting a lot of these questions, I feel that there might be some people out there that are afraid to ask questions or that may feel discouraged by some other folks that they know in the church or outside of church to even ask these questions. I feel that's quite sad. Yeah, I agree, honestly, and that's really sad to, to know that and to hear that. Yep. Right. Um, but I also think that God is the opposite of that, right? God wants us to question. God wants us to venture into this journey with Him, to ask questions, to learn more about His character. And the Bible is all about Him and this journey He's inviting us to be here. So keep setting in those questions. Yes, Rebecca, I agree. I believe we will be learning more about God for all eternity. But for now, I'm glad that we at least have Bible help us to help us in that journey. So keep those Bible questions coming. You can call or text us your questions at 833-BIBLE-HD, or you can send it in via Facebook, Instagram, or on our website at hopetv.org forward slash Bible help us. And if possible, don't forget to leave us an email so that we can contact you back. So Rebecca, who do we have joining us today? Joining us today, we have Dr. Felix Cortes. Dr. Cortes is an ordained pastor, a scholar, a preacher, and the author of numerous books and papers. He is currently a professor at the Theological Seminary on the campus of Andrews University. He has a PhD in religion with an emphasis in New Testament studies. Welcome, Dr. Cortes. We're so glad to have you again. Glad to be here. Also joining us today is Dr. David Sharaba. Dr. Sharaba is also an ordained pastor and currently an assistant professor of religion at Andrews University. He is earning a PhD in religion and systematic theology with an emphasis in ethics and his doctoral dissertation explores the concept of faith in the life of the believer. Welcome back, Dr. Sharaba. It's my privilege to be with you. Today, I'd like to share a message from John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, and it reads, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Now, sometimes I think it takes a couple of times for us to read that text. It sounds like it's kind of an opposition, but the main message that I get out of this and that I would like to share today is that there is salvation, there is freedom, and Jesus is basically putting it out there for us, right? We don't even have to go searching for it. Right. It's the good news in and of itself. And the good news is that He is still here today with you and I. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we wanna thank you again for giving us this time to study your word together. We invite the Holy Spirit's presence and we ask that every single person joining this program uh, will be able to learn more about you and have their questions answered. We pray in the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Let's get into our first question. We received via text from Barbara. And the question is, when did the Jewish nation stop the sacrifices of animals? Dr. Cortez, we have an interesting question here from Barbara. Where in the Bible can we find the answer to this question? Thank you. This is a historical question. And the short answer is that the Jewish nation stopped offering sacrifices when the temple was destroyed in AD 70, when the Romans came and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. But the question deserves a little more than that. You know, if you go to Deuteronomy 12, verses 5 and 6, you're going to find that God asked the people of Israel to bring all their sacrifices to the place where God's name was going to dwell. And that place was going to be Jerusalem, according to the later story found in the Old Testament. So all sacrifices were done in the Jerusalem temple. Now, if you go to Daniel 9, 27, well, 9, 26 and 27, you're going to find that Daniel prophesied that there was going to be an enemy that was going to come and destroy the city and that sacrifice will cease at the half of the week, 
meaning half of the prophetic week, which was going to be accomplished when Jesus died. But the most important question is, how this, how was this fulfilled? Well, the Bible says in Hebrews 10, verse 18, and probably we should go and read that passage. It says, where there is forgiveness of this, there is no longer any offering for sin. What this passage is saying is that since Jesus came and died on the cross and offered a sacrifice for sins that is valid once for all, there is no more need of animal sacrifices for our sins. So sacrifices stop being needed the moment Jesus died on the cross. The Jewish nation continued to offer sacrifices after Jesus' death because they didn't recognize the importance of the sacrifice of Jesus. Very interesting as well that if you go to Jerusalem, there is at least a sector of the the population that is preparing to, if they have an opportunity, to build the the temple again and offer sacrifices. I was in a place is called the Jerusalem Institute in Jerusalem, where they have, you know, the altar of sacrifice and the temple that they hope to be able to to build some time in the future. And they are hoping to offer sacrifices there if they had that opportunity. But the Bible says that Jesus is our sacrifice and he has provided the forgiveness that we need. Well, thank you so much for clarifying that, Dr. Cortez, and providing insight on that as well. And Dr. Sharaba, is there anything else you would like to add to this question here from Barbara? Uh, thank you, yes. Uh, so what Dr. Cortez, Cortez said is uh, exactly so. The Jewish nation stopped uh, at the moment uh, of the destruction of the temple and the city of Jerusalem. And uh, if uh, now, because you can visit Israel, if now the, you can see still somebody offering some sacrifices, it's not made officially. So it's just a, a personal initiative has, ha- has happened to me in the past when I visited Israel. So uh, that was a, a crucial moment for, for um, uh, the Jewish nation, uh, the destruction of the of the city and in the temple and i think that uh, officially they they yes they didn't offer any other sacrifice thank you dr shaba for adding that point as well thank you our next question we received a text from marvin and he asked is there scripture with the time of day that the dead in christ will be resurrected i have always heard the resurrection morning dr shaba i want to pass this on to you first so marvin is asking us does the bible tell us a time and not just the morning um what does what does the bible really tell us about the resurrection morning is there a specific time on here Thank you very much for this very interesting question. Resurrection morning gives us hope, you know, in thinking about the morning. Um, said this, I, uh, in the Bible, there are no references, references to a morning, a specific moment in the day uh, for the resurrection of the believers. Uh, nevertheless, we call that, I think, resurrection uh, morning because we, there are some hints making reference to um, uh, an special event. And the first uh, probably reason for why we call that uh, resurrection morning is uh, the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, the resurrection of Jesus happened very early in the morning. And here I'm taking uh, Matthew to to support this. uh, uh, Matthew 28, verses from 1 to 4. It says, After the Sabbath, at dawn, On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for the angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. So it is clear that if there is a reference to the morning as a moment of resurrection, this is the resurrection of Jesus. And so probably by association, we we think that also probably our resurrection will happen in the morning. The second reason for thinking of a resurrection morning is, in my opinion, is that death is described as a sleeping status. So death in the Bible is described as a a moment of sleep. 
And the uh, first Thessalonians 4.14 uh, reminds us this. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. So this is very interesting. So the waking up from the sleeping status happens usually at morning. And I thought probably this is also another way to think of a resurrection morning. So that after sleeping on, on the in the morning, we wake up. We wake up with Jesus because he is waking us up. And I think there is also a, th a third um, reason. The resurrection also represents a new era, a new beginning, which usually is associated to the concept of a new morning. So uh, if, um, if uh, we consider all these three aspects, and there might be other reasons too, um, then we can say that uh, the resurrection morning might be a reality. But uh, the Bible uh, never gives us a specific reference of a moment uh, with respect to the, the, the resurrection of the believers. Thank you, Dr. Shraba. Um, I loved how you painted the picture for us that, you know, this, we may not know the exact time of the day, but we are given a promise and it is definite in the Bible that Jesus, in fact, will come back and take us with him. So that is still the good news. Thank you, Marvin, for sending in the question. Go to our next question. We received a text from Marie. And the question is, a previous episode stated that at death, the soul ceases to exist and the spirit goes back to God. I thought the spirit doesn't go back until the second coming, not at the time of death. Please clarify this for me. And Dr. Sharaba, we want to bring you in on this question here. What can we say to Marie here concerning bringing the spirit back to God at death. Thank you very much for this uh, interesting and important question. Uh, my answer will be yes, uh, the spirit goes back to God at death. Uh, nevertheless, I would like uh, that uh, it, it, it is clear for us that we, we are not going to confuse the word spirit with the word soul. The human, human being was created by God with two elements, dust and breath of life, which in, in, in Hebrew is the ruach, so the spirit. And um, the result of this creation gives uh, the life to us, to the human beings. And uh, we become living beings or living souls according to the different translations. In fact, Genesis 2, 7 reads, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So the word spirit and the word soul are totally separated, and they mean two different realities. The spirit is the breath of life, and the soul is the result of the union of the dust and the breath of life, so the spirit. So at death, uh, the breath of life, so the spirit, uh, given by God uh, at birth, goes back to God as reported by Solomon in Ecclesiastes 12, 7, which reads, Remember him before the silver cord is severed and the golden ball is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring and the wheel broken at the well, and the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. So this uh, spirit does not have a life or existence in itself. It is just the principle of life that God gives us, is the energy that God gives us, gives to every human, human being, but also to every animal. And uh, so um, it is important for us to remember that even animals receive this uh, spirit. And this is also recorded uh, by Solomon in uh, always in Ecclesiastes in chapter 3, verses from 18 to 21, which says, I also said to myself, as for humans, God tests them so that they may see that they are like the animals. Surely the fate of human beings is like 
that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Human have no advantage over animals. Everything is meaningless. All go to the same place. All come from dust, and to dust all return. Who knows if the human spirit rises upward and if the spirit of the animals goes down into uh, earth? So uh, this text is so useful for us to understand that death is the natural decomposition of our being and uh, our, um, let's say, physical part goes back to the dust and our breath of life, so our spirit, goes back to God. And so um, we need just to pay attention to not confuse spirit with soul uh, because soul is the result of the union of dust and uh, spirit. Thank you, Dr. Sharaba, for adding that. And Dr. Cortez, before we go on break, is there anything else you would like to add to this question here? I would like to add something interesting that Jesus said. Jesus said, Father, into hands I commit my spirit. The question is, what did what was Jesus committing to his, to his Father? And um, in the New Testament, spirit sometimes refers to the inner life of the person, you know, sadness, emotions, gladness. So you find in some parts that the spirit is provoked, the spirit is moved, meaning you are provoked, you feel a little bit angry, moved, you feel a little bit um, um, impacted by actions of other persons, etc. So the internal life. So when Jesus said, into your hands I commit my spirit, is into hands I commit all my hopes, all my desires for the future, all my faith that you are going to fulfill your word. That is in your hands. And hoping and knowing that it's going to be true, that God is going to fulfill his word and he is going to bring back right Jesus from the dead in the future and uh, fulfill the salvation of human beings. So that is what probably Jesus is, is saying there, I, into your hands I commit my spirit. That internal desires and hopes and uh, faith that he has in his Father. Thank you for that, Dr. Cortez, and Dr. Schauber as well for answering this question. I understand it could be a little confusing, so I understand where Marie is coming from. Thank you both. Just a reminder before we take a break, if you haven't checked out our Bible study resource site at hope.study, it's just a few easy clicks. There are new studies being added regularly, including a course called The World of Spirits with Dr. Bruce Bauer. Or if you want a hard copy sent to your mail, we also have free Bible study guides that we can mail to you in North America. You can call and leave us your address and we will get those sent to you. We're going to take a quick break now, but we'll be right back, so don't go away. Welcome back to Bible Help Desk. Remember, you can call or text us your questions at 833-BIBLE-HD or find us on Facebook, Instagram, or our website at hopetv.org slash Bible Help Desk. Then tune in to see if one of our guests answers your question. Our guests answering your questions today is Dr. Sharaba and Dr. Cortez. All right, let's jump ahead into our next question. We received a text and the question is, there are four angels in Revelation chapter 7, verse 1, who stop the winds from blowing on the earth and the trees. Are they good angels or bad angels? We have a very interesting question here. Dr. Cortez, I'm going to pass this to you. Are the angels good or bad? And what is this text talking about when it says the wind? Can you just kind of unpack this for us? Thank you. Uh, this this question is very interesting. It's referring to Revelation 7. I think it would be good for us to go and look at the passage. Revelation 7 says, After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number, etc. So this is 
This is a reference to four angels that are in the four corners of the earth. Uh, the four corners are north, south, east, west. That is how the people in the New Testament refer to the four points of the, you know, the directions in the earth. And they are holding back the four winds of the earth so that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree and damage them. So yes, these angels have the power of cause destruction, not because they are evil, but because since they are holding back the winds that want to destroy the earth, according to the vision of Revelation 7, then if they release the winds, then the winds are going to destroy the earth. So these angels are at the service of God, and they are holding back the forces of destruction. Okay, These winds are a symbol in the book of Revelation of the forces of destruction that are under the power of Satan. Okay, so these are angels of God, and they hold back the winds so that the people of God may have time to be sealed uh, with the seal of God. And that is the important thing. These angels are making possible time for the people of God to receive the, the seal of protection from, from God. Uh, this seal of protection, if we go to different parts of the, of, of the Bible, refers to the Holy Spirit uh, filling our lives and enabling us to live lives of worship and, 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 and praise to God and, um, and, living and producing the fruits of the Spirit. So these angels make possible for the people of God to produce the fruits of the Spirit. So yes, they are angels of God under the power of God that prevent destruction before uh, the people of God are ready for uh, the time of the end. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Cortez, for unpacking that. I also wanna pass it to Dr. Shiraba. Uh, would you like to add anything else? Uh, these good angels that are uh, actually helping us to, to see the blessings of God and so to prevent that evil manifest itself fully in a, in a very fast way that we cannot have the time to, uh, to, yeah, to grow in our experience with Jesus. So um, and I think that um, it's a beautiful image um, that, um, that uh, Revelation is using to telling us that God is taking care of us, each one of us, as, uh, as Felix has um, underlined. So I think that they are good angels and they are doing a, a, a beautiful job for us uh, so that evil um, is uh, growing little by little so we can see that, we can see and can observe and we can take action so that we can continue uh, being uh, children of God. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Shrava, for answering that. Uh, you know, Crystal, I think it's really cool what, what has been brought up of God being a just God again, as we've talked about it before, and just giving us protection and direction. Um, Amen. And it's imagery, but it's really just interesting to study the Bible. So questions like this, I hope you keep sending them in because I'm learning too. And learning as well. <laughs> um, I hope you're growing from it as well. Amen. Thank you. Our next question we received via text, will there be a period of pre-tribulation? Dr. Shraba, interesting question here. Anywhere in the Bible that can help us out with this question? Uh, first of all, we need to clarify what is the period of tribulation. Usually this uh, period of tribulation is identified with a special time happening just before Christ's coming. So uh, this word is found in several texts, the word tribulation, no? talking about the soon coming of the Lord and the signs of the time. So, for example, if we take Revelation 7, uh, verses 13 to 14, the text says, Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they, and where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and they made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So here we have the mention of the, um, the, of the great tribulation. 
So when is that Great Tribulation? Uh, the Great Tribulation is a period that will happen uh, just before uh, Christ uh, coming. So the question um, that has been asked was the if uh, when is the time of pre-tribulation, or is there something that we can recognize the time of pre-tribulation? Uh, in, in in poor terms, I I, I can say that a, a pre-tribulation period would probably indicate a time like our time right now in which we are awaiting the second coming but we are not yet in the very last days so a time of pre-tribulation is the time where we see uh, that there is some evil we see that we are suffering we see that uh, we are experiencing the consequences of sin but at the same time we are experiencing the blessings of uh, of god in our lives and so it's a time that uh, the period of tribu uh, is not yet the time of full tribulation. It's a, so it's a time, a normal time, as any other time in history. Thank you, Dr. Sharaba, for clarifying that. I understand that could be a tricky, tough question that we received today. Dr. Cortez, is there anything else that you would like to add before we wrap up? Um, yes, um, this issue of tribulation is, uh, is an interesting thing that has occurred since there has been uh, a war between uh, good and evil. So uh, a very interesting passage, you can find this in John 3, verses 17 and, and following. It says, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Verse 20, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. When God brings light into the life of a person through the message through a, a, an individual that preaches the gospel or or gives a good advice, etc., uh, this sometimes produces a, 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 a reaction in other people. Uh, the, the darkness hates the light because the light exposes the dark um, attitudes and actions of wickedness. So. That's why there is tribulation. And this tribulation has happened from the beginning of the world, from the time of Abel and Cain. It's going to be worse in the end because it's going to be the climax of this of this conflict. But God is going to win this conflict as he is light himself and the champion of the forces of light. So we need to trust in him and, 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 and be in his side as we... As we come uh, to the end uh, of, 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 of life in this world, uh, according to the prophecies that we find in the Bible. Thank you so much, Dr. Cortez, for providing insight on this question as well. Dr. Sharabra, Dr. Cortez, we thank you both for being here and helping us with these tough questions today. We hope that you guys can join us again soon. And thank you to our viewers for joining us. We'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.